But tonight we're in Deuteronomy chapter 27. To begin, we're going to be moving through chapter 30. And if you're taking notes tonight, the title of this message is Blessing and Cursing. Blessing and Cursing. And of course, we know it is Moses who wrote the book of Deuteronomy. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. And the theme of this book, of course, is equipped to enter in, as that is exactly what Moses is doing as he is speaking to the nation of Israel there at the border of Canaan, that is the promised land. He is equipping them through God's word to enter into the land and to take a hold of it. And we've broken this book up into three sections, looking at remembering the past in chapters one through three. We finished the second section last week, looking at reviewing in the present in chapters four through 26. And tonight we begin the third section, starting in chapter 27, which will span to the end of the book, looking at Moses readying the people for the future. And as we begin tonight, again, we're beginning the third and final section of this. And as we do so, we really begin looking at the final sermon that Moses gives and really his last words that he begins to give here to the children of Israel. And you know, if you've been here, that as he's been speaking to them, he has laid out the heart of God for the people, that they would be truly God's people and live in light of being God's people. That is that they would follow his word. They would look to the commandments that he has given, the instruction, the direction, and they would follow that. And all through the Lord's commands being heard and applied, they would be seen as his people in the land that they were going into. And that's exactly what Moses is going to hone in on both tonight and as we finish the book next week, where as we study, we will see Moses calling the people really to action. As he has laid out all of the truth from the word of God, well, now what he seeks to do is call the people to apply it. And he does so in sharing once again that as the people live for the Lord and in light of the commandments of God, that they will experience blessing. That as they enter into the land of Canaan, they will experience the blessing of God as they live in light of all that God has commanded them to do. However, on the other side of that coin, he shows that if they fail to do so, if they walk in disobedience, well, then what awaits them is not blessing, but cursing. And that is what we will see throughout the text this evening. But also, too, very interesting tonight and something to note, and we'll make sure to flesh this out as we get to it, is as Moses shows what obedience to the Lord looks like and what disobedience to the Lord also looks like, he's also going to, in showing there that there is cursing and disobedience, he's going to look forward into the future of Israel. You see, Moses, throughout the word of God, at times is referred to as a prophet. And one of the reasons, really a few of the reasons, we see tonight in the text as we study through here. And it's really interesting as we see Moses used as a prophet tonight, as he looks forward into the future of Israel and lays out some prophecy that came to pass in the nation of Israel in its history. And as we get there, it is some neat stuff, and we'll make sure to, uh, to flesh that out and look at it um, as we do. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the text now. We're going to begin there in verse 1 of chapter 27. We will read through verse 10 together to begin. We'll pray one more time after that, and then we'll keep on going. So Deuteronomy chapter 27, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today, and it shall be on the day when you cross over the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, that you shall set up for yourselves large stones and whitewash them with lime. And you shall write on them all the words of the law when you have crossed over, that you may enter the land which the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord God of your fathers promised you. And therefore it shall be that when you have crossed over the Jordan, that on Mount Ebal you shall set up these stones, which I command you today, and you shall whitewash them with lime, and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones, and you shall not use an iron tool on them. You shall build with whole stones the altar of the Lord your God and offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. You shall offer peace offerings and you shall eat there and rejoice before the Lord your God. And you shall write very plainly on the stones all the words of this law. And then Moses and the priests, the Levites, they spoke to all Israel saying, take heed and listen, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. So therefore you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe his commandments and his statutes, which, which I command you today. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for this evening. Lord, any time that we as your people get to gather together, it is such a blessing. And I just thank you, Lord, 
that uh, tonight these people have chosen to come here, Lord, and to take a, a break out of the middle of, of a busy week, which is in a busy season, Lord, and come and sit before really you, Lord, and worship you in song and in praise, and Lord, to dive into your word. I just thank you so much for that, and I thank you that you are here with us tonight. And God, I pray that as we study your word, as we continue through this book, that Lord, we would know that this is truly your word. And and as such, it has something to say to us, Lord. Your word is that which equips us for life with you, to live in this world, to honor you and to glorify you, to show you to the world around us. And God, uh, what we study tonight, it 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 is for that purpose, Lord, in our lives. And so I pray that God, we would treat it that way. I pray the Lord our hearts and minds would be open and we'd be ready, Lord, to hear what you have to say tonight. And God, we ask for your help in understanding what your word has to say. We look to you, Lord, to teach us. And Lord, we look to you also to help us to apply what we learn. And God, we we look for that help expectantly because, Lord, we know that you're faithful. We know you're so good. You're so faithful, Lord, to meet us and to lead us. And so we ask that you do that now. And we ask, God, that we would uh, understand what your word says and know how to apply it. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, as Moses begins to speak again, what he does is he calls for the people to hear the Lord's heart for when they cross over into the promised land. And specifically what we see is it relates to them holding to his word and worshiping him as they do so. And we notice there in verses 1 through 8 that as they are to come into the land, some specific instructions were given in relation to both a monument that they were to set up, as well as an altar that they were to set up and then worship upon. We see there specifically there in verse 6, or or in verses 6 through 8, it says, you shall build with whole stones the altar of the Lord your God and offer burnt offerings On it to the Lord your God, you shall offer peace offerings, you shall eat there and rejoice before the Lord, and you shall write very plainly on the stones, that is the stones they were to set up, you were to write very plainly all the words of this law. You see, as the people came into the land, the Lord wanted them to, in this first act of worship, what he wanted them to do was to come in and to really set up for themselves this remembering of what had been said, the remembering of what Moses had shared with the people up to this point, that they were to be his people and to follow his word. And I really like the explanation that is given there, the instruction that is given. As the Lord called for them to set these stones up and to write upon it the law, it was again to concrete in their hearts all of the word that had been shared. But then they were also to make sure, notice, that what was written was very plain. It was very plain and very clear. The Lord wanted his people to know what his word was, and they wanted them to put on these stones in clear writing so everyone could see, so there'd be no question what the heart of the Lord was. And we see that instruction given, but also too, there the instruction to build the altar out of whole stones. There was not to be a tool that was working on them, but it was to just be built there and not um, fashioned by tools, but it was to be built as the Lord prescribed. And then they were to offer, we notice there, two specific offerings. That is the burnt offering. What is the burnt offering of consecration, of surrender and worship to the Lord? And then also the peace offering. We notice that as well. And if you remember the peace offering, when we studied it back in the beginning of the book of Leviticus, well, we describe that as really what it is. And that is this fellowship type of offering between the worshiper and the Lord. We can think barbecue with the Lord, and that gets you pretty close. This amazing opportunity to worship the Lord with smoked, delicious meat and that you eat there, and you and the Lord are in fellowship with one another. And the Lord, he makes it very clear that as they enter into the land, this is to be something that the people, they walk in. And they do so, again, so as to set in their minds, concrete in their heart and minds, that the Lord has brought them into the land, and he wants them to live in a certain way, and that way is according to his word and in worship to him. It's very clear. It's very plain. And it's very relatable to our own lives as the Lord has given to us his word very clearly, very plainly as we have it in our laps tonight. We have it on devices. We have his word, his instruction, and it is to be always before us. And we are to see it plainly as for our lives. But also to the invitation always to worship the Lord with our lives, to offer ourselves, to offer our lives to him. Well, that is something that we are called to as we enter into and live the life that the Lord has for us. And there are very relatable instructions there given in the beginning. But then also too, we notice in verses nine through 10, 
that as Moses continues, he calls for the people to realize that as they have heard the instruction, the instruction they are going to put there on those stones and have in their hearts that they walk in as they go into the land, that now is not only time to listen to the words of the Lord, but now it is time to begin applying them. You see, what Moses is saying here in the opening of this, of this third section is that, hey guys, as you have heard the word, you have been the hearers, now it is time for you to be doers. It is time for the people to walk in light of all that God has said. And when it comes to the word of God, this is something that, of course, is for everyone to understand. And the word of God is not just to be that which is heard and then left there as something that was good, you know, just as a token fortune or something that was nice, some nice sayings or some great stories. But the word of God is that which people are to hear and then apply. You know, the book of James there in the New Testament speaks to this explicitly. In James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, James says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, well, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself and then he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But it says that he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, well, this one will be blessed in what he does. You see, the word of God it is not just given to humanity for, again, just uh, some nice stories and some good advice to know is there, but it is given to humanity to lead and to equip the life of every human being. It is given to us to show us who the Lord is and who we are in relationship to the Lord, both naturally and what is available to us, and then how that relationship that we are invited to live with the Lord, how it is to be lived out. And for that, we are to be people, bringing it to our home, to our life personally tonight, we are to be people who don't just hear the word and again, just chalk it up as something nice, but we are those that are doers of the words. And I love the imagery there of, of James and how he shares that the one who looks and who's just a hearer of the word, but not a doer, well, what they are like is that man who observes his natural face in the mirror. Think the, you know, the image that is before your eyes when you wake up in the morning, you know, and if you're not sure about that, you can consult your mirror in the morning, or if you're married, perhaps your spouse. And you can, you know, see that, that as you wake up, you know, you got the, the boogies in your eyes and the things and all the things, your hair's kind of doing this weird thing right here. And, and what James is speaking of here is the man who is just a hearer, but not a doer. Well, it's the same as if I was to go to the mirror in the morning and look at it and be like, we're good to go. And then head on to work. There would be scared people when I entered into the office. I promise you that. But the person who looks into the word, looks into the truth of the word, just as we, as we look into the mirror and we say, I've got to do something about that. Well, that's what James is exhorting us to. That's what the Bible points to our lives to be. The Bible points to our lives to be those that are changed by the word as we apply the word to our lives, as we let it move and work in and through us. And that's what Moses is calling the people for here. He's calling the Israelites there to, as they have heard the word, to be ready now to apply the word personally to their lives. And my friends, we're called again to the same thing. We're called to the same thing in every facet and point of our life as the Bible speaks on things of life. Really everything of life we are equipped for by the word of God. We aren't again just to hear it and move on. We are to hear it and do something about it. We're to hear it and apply it. And I pray that we would, because that's the instruction that we see given to them and that which we benefit from as well as we live for the Lord. And it is after this instruction is given that Moses, as he continues on, now he gives an interesting set of instructions for when the people have crossed over into the land. Let's pick up there in verse 11. Some very interesting things are said here. It says, and as Moses commanded the people on the same day, he says, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you have crossed over the Jordan. That is Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these, he says, shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse. That is Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. You see, as the people of Israel were to move into the land of Canaan, and really rather far into the land, actually, the instructions that are given here are not just for right as they get into, but they are as they conquer part of the land and are able to get further into the interior of the land. Well, they were to gather together as one nation, but they were to be split in half with six tribes on Mount Gerizim, and then the other six were to be on Mount Ebal. 
And it was on these two mountains, we see the instruction there, that the blessings and the curses were to be spoken by the Levites. And as they did, as they were spoken, the people of Israel, well, they would respond. They would respond in acknowledgement of acceptance of what the Lord had said by saying, we see there, amen. And as we continue to read, Moses elaborates on the curses first that are to be spoken there from the mountain. Pick it with me there in verse 14. He says there, and the Levite shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel, cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image an abomination to the Lord. The work of the hands of the craftsmen are set up in secret and the people, he says, shall answer and say, amen. And he continues on, curses the one who treats his father, his mother with contempt. The people shall say, amen. Curse the one who moves his neighbor's landmark. Again, the people say, amen. Curse the one who makes a blind to wander, the blind to wander off the road. Again, they say, amen. The curse is the one who perverts justice. Do the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his father's wife because he's uncovered his father's bed. Again, they answer accordingly. Cursed is the one who lies with any kind of animal. The people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, his daughter of his mother. The people shall say, Amen. And again, cursed is the one who lies with his mother in law. They say, Amen. Cursed is the one who attacks his neighbor secretly. Amen. And cursed is the one who takes a bribe to slay innocent, an innocent person. Amen. And cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. And again, the people, it says, shall say, amen. And we see that as the curses are pronounced by the Levites there, that as they hear them, what is to happen? Or the people are to, again, answer in acknowledgement of accepting that as truth by saying, amen. They give this acknowledgement of agreement with what God's word is saying. Really, what is the standard for their life? They are there agreeing that, hey, this this is from the Lord, and this is for us to apply to our lives. And this is something that brings a great opportunity. We know we don't think about this, I believe, uh, too often in our Christian life. And as we talk like believers and, you know, at times can even go through uh, the motions of Christian life, it brings to, to, to light really what, what's saying amen, what it is, what it signifies. And as we see here, the people are to say amen as they hear the word of God, they're spoken to them. Though what they are saying, in essence, is so be it, that as the people were hearing, cursed be this person for doing this, or cursed be this for this, they are saying, yes, absolutely, we agree with the word of God. We agree with what is being said. And for us as believers, again, who at times, I mean, at any given time, you finish praying at the dinner table, or you finish praying, you know, at bedtime with your children, or with your spouse, or just on your own, and you say, amen. But do we really at times realize exactly what we are doing? You know, that amen is giving this acknowledgement of acceptance of the truth, giving an acknowledgement and a so be it, a I identify with that truth type of statement as we do so. That is something very important because what it does is it brings to weight the things that we pray. It brings to weight the things that we think on as we speak to the Lord or as we're in, you know, the, the gathering of God's people like we are tonight. You know, as we listen to the word of God preached, as we listen to it taught maybe on a podcast or in our car or something like that, you're at home doing some work around the house and you're listening to a sermon, you know, it can well up within you at times to say, hey, amen to that brother or amen to that. Or you're having conversation with someone over coffee and they say something that is from the Lord. You say, amen, sister, that is amazing. But do we really realize exactly what we're saying? And then do we live in light of that after having said that? It's very important to think on those things. Because again, amen, like so many other things within our Christian vernacular, it can become those things that just kind of, you know, we say it because that's what we say and that's what we do. But do we really believe in what we're, in what we're identifying with? It's very important. And here the people definitely needed to be paying attention as they were, you know, agreeing with. I mean, you just look there at verse 26. And it said, Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. You think about that. Someone who's just kind of drifting off into la-la land. And then they're like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be saying amen right now. Amen. But in their heart, they're like, what did he just say? You know, that was a... That was, a, that was a wrong motive, a wrong mindset. And so what is needed was engagement. What was needed was paying attention so as to, again, acknowledge and agree and walk forward with the Lord. It's something important to see here and something important for us to think about as well. 
And that brings us to really the beginning of chapter 28. And we see the same practice is outlined there. But this time, it is with the blessings being shared with the people. Let's pick up there in verse 1. We're going to read through verse 15. Where it says, Now it shall come to pass that if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all, the, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And so blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of, the, of your ground in the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, the increase of the offspring of your flocks. And blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall, be, shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. And the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face, and they shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in the storehouses and all the which you set your hands, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. And the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods and the fruit of your body and the increase of your livestock and the produce of your ground in the land of the Lord, which in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. And the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above all be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today and are careful to observe them, so shall you not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to be to the right or the left, to go after other gods and to serve them. But it shall come to pass, verse 15 says, that if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all of these curses will come upon you and overtake you. As Moses here shares what is to be shared again, what is the blessing? It is easy to see the blessings that come upon the people as they are obedient to the Lord. He says there that you will be blessed, whether you're in the city or you're in the field. You'll be blessed in your home. You'll be blessed with your herds and your flocks. You'll be, as you are obedient to the Lord, he says, hey, you will be blessed. There is great blessing that we see that comes from the obedience that the people were to walk in before the Lord. And notice there in verse two, what it says about these blessings. I really like the language that is used here because it paints such a beautiful picture of how the Lord works as he says there in verse 2, and all of these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You see, the blessing of God, we notice there, will overtake the people as they are obedient. That is, that the blessings will take hold of or be upon. Think of the idea of being seized upon, if you will. The person's life will be in that way, and it will be real, and it will be seen. And that's something there for the people to hear. For them to know that, hey, as you walk in this way, your life will be blessed. And that's something that we've talked about before as we have been studying the Bible. And especially in the, you know, the first five books of the Bible, especially as it comes to the people being called to obedience, the Lord consistently talks about, hey, as you are obedient to my word, as you walk in my ways, that there is blessing that comes. That there is blessing in your life. You are blessed in a blessed state as you live for the Lord. And sometimes what can happen is people will, will hear that and they'll think to themselves, oh, well, I don't need to dive too far into that because that becomes, you know, prosperity. You know, that becomes this idea that if I, you know, just do what I'm supposed to do, then God owes me something and, you know, it's just going to happen uh, because of this transactional relationship that me and God have. And where, where I understand that can go, and we'll talk about that in a moment, understand there is nothing wrong with looking at the promise of the Word of God to where if people of God walk after the Lord in obedience, that there is blessing. There is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with looking to what God has to say about walking in obedience and the reality that that is a blessing. That's, 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 that's God's word. That's what he says. Now, where this gets dangerous and where we need to be careful is when people try to tag on to this idea of blessing, this, this thought process that as you're blessed, so too will nothing bad ever happen to you. That is where you go from being biblical to being unbiblical. 
And there's this great heresy within the church. And there are men and women who have built an entire um, denomination, if you will, or even an entire movement, entire churches around this thought process of, hey, as you follow the Lord, as you give your life to Jesus, you give of your time, especially you give of your resources and your talents and all that stuff. And as you do that, well, then your life will be free of problems. As you do that, your life will be free of problems. You'll never be sick. You'll always be wealthy and healthy and nothing will ever go wrong with you. But let me tell you right now, if someone seeks to tell you that if you follow Jesus, all your problems go away, they are lying to your face. They're lying to you. And if they claim to be your friend, they're not your friend. You need new friends. And I'll tell you that's the truth because understand, nowhere within the word of God do we see God ever promise a life of ease. Nowhere in his word does he ever promise that as we are obedient to him, that we are free of sickness, that we are free of financial hurt, that we are free of pain in our lives. Nowhere do we see that. And that's the danger when people seek to say that, hey, you know, if you follow the Lord, you'll be blessed in this way and all these things will just go away from you. That's, that's not biblical. But to look at the truth of God's word and to see that he says, hey, as you are obedient, there is a blessing to your life. Hey, that right there, that is from the Lord's. And that's from the Lord for us to take a hold of tonight, friends, to take hold of the reality that as we follow Jesus, we are blessed. Life is not always easy because we live in a fallen world and we deal with sin, our own and the sins of others around us and the consequences of both. But understand that as we live life for the Lord, there is blessing. And that blessing, understand, may not even be fully realized until we are with the Lord one day in heaven. But I take God at his word, and we all should do that, that as we look at the truth of God's word, again, verse two, it says, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, he says, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. That was for the Israelites. That's also for us tonight, friends. It absolutely is. And that should be something that spurs us on to be obedient to the Lord. It should spur us on to live out our lives, following after his standard, his word, and seeing the blessing that comes in our life. And I think one of the greatest blessings of obedience is the blessing of knowing that God is with us as we go through the hard things. The blessing of knowing that God is with us when the pains of this world come around. Again, it's a sad day when you believe in Jesus and someone along the way tells you, hey, as you believe in Jesus, everything's going to be great for you. And then something's not, man, what a hard thing to, to, to come to face. But what an amazing way to be able to navigate that is by knowing that, hey, as I'm obedient to the Lord, I am blessed. And hey, I'm even blessed in the trial. I'm even blessed in the fire, knowing that God is with me. And what's more, he was honest with me about those things coming around. And so we see here that as the people were obedient, that the blessings of God would overtake them. But also notice, and the reason we read into verse 15 is that the same word overtake is used again, but on the other side of the coin. Read verse 15 with me again. As he says, but it shall come to pass that if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all of these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And the curses that he's speaking of are the ones that flow through the rest of the chapter. If you read verse 16 through verse um, 68, well, that is what you find are all these different curses, the consequences really of sin that uh, will come over the people. And as Moses elaborates more, as he goes through on the results of disobedience, notice that he uses the same word, overtake, in reference to those curses that will come upon the whole nation of Israel. And I really, again, I think that that word overtake is such an appropriate word and warning really for us when it comes to the consequence of sin. Again, we look at the blessings overtaking us when we are obedient to the Lord. And I think that is wonderful. But it is also an appropriate word when it comes to us being um, you know, complacent in our sin. And so often what happens is when it comes to sin, especially secret sin, is we tend to think that our sin, that it goes unnoticed, don't we? We tend to think that it goes unnoticed. I mean, we may get busted from time to time, but, you know, people, uh, you know, they don't see when we, when we sin as we're alone. But please understand that either by people seeing the results of our sin, and even if they don't know what the source is, and always from the Lord, our sin is never hidden. Understand that our sin never goes unnoticed. And we need to know that that is always the case. Sin is never unnoticed by the Lord. He never misses anything. You know, in the book of Hebrews, the author writes in Hebrews 4.13 that there is no creature hidden from his sight. That is from the Lord's sight. But all things, he says, are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give 
an account. See, the Lord sees everything. There is no sin, understand, that goes unnoticed. But yet, there is this proclivity that we have in our minds and in our lives to live that way. This is humans. That's what we do. To go on doing what we want to, again, as if no one sees, and worse than that, as if nothing will happen. But again, the truth of the Word of God shows us that when it comes to our sin and our living in disobedience, there are things that happen. You know, I think of James again, in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. He says there, let no one say that when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one, it says, is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And so then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, it says, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You see, never, sin never goes unnoticed by the Lord. It never does. The Bible is explicit on that, and it always brings a curse. It always brings consequence. It always, James says, destroys. It brings death. And that death may be, we've seen in the Bible, physical, but more oftentimes, that death is spiritual. That death is spiritual. It's relational. Sin, understand, it damages far more than I think we ever seek to realize or ever want to admit. Sin damages, whether it's secret or all out in front. Sin, it always, always destroys. And as such, it brings a curse. It brings upon destruction. And Moses, as he's sharing with the Israelites, he says that these curses, they will, they will overtake. And as he does so, he's really showing the seriousness of sin, that sin is a serious thing to God and should be taken seriously in the life of those that seek to follow the Lord. And that, that's for us tonight, friends. And again, I know that you're here on a Wednesday night, so you know this. This is, this is basic Bible stuff. You read in the Bible, sin is bad. Yes, absolutely. The wages of sin is death, we know, from Romans 6, 23. But understand that as we walk with the Lord. We never outgrow the need for a reminder that sin is dangerous, that sin is to be taken seriously. And for all of us here tonight, whether it's a sin that's out front and known, but yet we're not dealing with, or something that's secret that we think no one knows about, we need to understand that the Lord, He knows about it. And the effects of that sin, they are permeating our life, even if we don't notice it, or maybe we do, we just don't want to admit it. And what needs to happen is it needs to be taken very seriously so that our lives are continued to walk in the way that God wants them to walk. Again, right before this, he talks about the blessing that overtakes because of obedience. Here, he talks about the cursing that overtakes because of disobedience. And I think that idea of cursing overtaking, that should really strike home with us. Because again, we may think that our sin goes unnoticed, but one day we wake up and there it is. We wake up and the issue is right in front of our face and our life and the lives of so many around us are ruined because we didn't take sin seriously. And you know, I'm so thankful because we know that we have the ability to deal with our sin through Jesus Christ. You know, through his work on the cross of Calvary, his finished work and the invitation to deal with our sin, man, we can, we can live rightly. I love 1 John 1, 9. such a great verse to commit to memory. It says, if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is such an amazing thing where we need to take sin seriously, but also to take seriously the grace of God to forgive us of our sin and to deal with it and to lead us into a life that is better, a life that is with Him, lived in a way that is after His heart. And through Jesus, we can confess and we can find forgiveness and walk forward in the obedience to the Lord where we experience, as he said a moment ago, the blessings of God. That's for us tonight, friends. And the Lord doesn't have and doesn't desire for us to walk in sin, the consequences that come with that. He desires for us to walk in the blessing of a life of forgiveness and dealing with our sin. So I pray we take that to heart because as it was for the Israelites, so too is it for us. And as you read through the rest of chapter 28 on your own, and I encourage you to do so, you'll see exactly what the Lord says will come upon the people as they walk in that disobedience, as they walk the cursing, the consequences that would come upon them. God is very clear and very specific about what will happen. And it is that specificity that I want to draw your attention to now, because as I said a moment ago, Moses in this section, what he does is he really shows, we have some scenarios here in the text where Moses shows out that he is not just, again, God's man, his leader for the nation of Israel, but he is also a prophet of God who is used by the Lord to prophesy over the nation of Israel some things that were uh, going to happen to them as they walked in disobedience to the Lord. 
And you know, before we get into that, just a great reminder for all of us tonight as believers and as Bible students that the Bible is God's word. We know that, and I I hope that you always hold it that way. But the Bible is also, amongst all the other religious books in the world, the Bible is distinct. Because the Bible, understand, is a grouping, not of just one book, but of 66 books that are grouped together by various authors, over 40 authors, in fact, that was written over the span of a very long time. And as they are all compiled together, they perfectly go together. They never contradict. They never go against one another. The Bible is distinct in that way. But something else that makes the Bible truly special is that it contains so much prophecy that has been fulfilled. And not just fulfilled to where you could say, oh man, you know, that's really cool. You know, by happenstance, these things happen kind of in the same way that they said it was going to happen. No, things happened exactly as the Bible said they were going to happen, and it's amazing to see that. And really what it does is it gives us this great confidence in the Word of God to know that the Bible is distinct amongst all the other religious books that are out there. And it also, too, gives us a great hope in the prophecies that we read within the Word of God that have not yet come to pass. Because understand, there are things in the Bible that we read that we, as the church, as believers, we look forward to. You know, thinking about eschatology, looking to the end time prophecies of the rapture of the church, the return of Jesus Christ, the setting up of the millennial reign of Christ, the new heaven, the new earth. You know, so many other prophecies that we see through the word of God that have come to pass, man, they help us to really know that the things that have been said, they're going to come to pass as well. And that's a blessing, man. That is a blessing from the Lord. And it's a reason for us to see as prophecy is shown in the Bible, we should take note of that. We should take note because it makes the Bible, again, so distinct and different and worth believing in so many ways. And as Moses is sharing here about the consequences of sin and disobedience to the Lord and the nation of Israel, what he does is, again, look forward into the future, and he prophesies two instances where the Lord will deal in judgment with his people. And the first one we see there in verses 36 and 37. Pick up with me there as we read those two, verse, or those, those, uh, two verses. As he says, The Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, and you shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. What is described here in these two verses is the future exile of Israel following the times of the kings there in the nation of Israel. And if you have read the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, and then of course the books of 1st and 2nd Kings, you can also read 1st and 2nd Chronicles as well for the same uh, story, then you know that in Israel's history, starting with King Saul and then going to David and then to Solomon, and then after that, so many other kings after, that during the time of the kings of Israel, well, there were many problems that were present. There were problems as many of the kings of Israel, especially after Solomon, well, they led the nation of Israel consistently into idolatry. Led them consistently to live and to walk in ways that were displeasing to the Lord and lived really in stark disobedience to the words that we have been reading and studying in the first five books of the Bible, which brought along ultimately and finally there in 586 BC, the exile of the the nation of Judah at that time, uh, the 10 tribes of Israel that were in the north, they went first, but Judah, which really solidified this exile of God's people, well, that took place in 586 BC at the hand of Babylon. And Moses here, again, all the way back in Deuteronomy, he looks forward and he says there that, hey, the Lord will bring you and the king. They're saying, hey, there's going to be a king over you. In fact, he's going to be after a long line of very wicked kings. And there's going to be another power that comes in, takes you, the king and everyone, and takes you to a land where there is not just the one true God, but many gods. And as a people, you will be forced into those places to live there in exile, again, because of the sin. And you shall become, he says, an astonishment, a proverb, a byword among all the nations where the Lord will drive you. He seeks to say that, hey, as you are my people, the nations of the world around you are going to know that you were to be distinct, you were to be different, but yet because of your sin, you're going to be, become something that was like, wow, what happened, to, what happened to Israel? What happened to those people that were supposed to be, I don't know, where are they? Oh, they're in Babylon. And so Moses, he prophesies over that. But the next prophecy jumps forward in time. Take a look at verse 47 with me now, reading through verse 52. 
As he says, because you do not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart, except for the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. And the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies. And a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly, nor show sure favor to the young. And they shall eat the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land until you are destroyed. And they shall not leave you grain or new wine or oil or the increase of your, of your cattle or the offspring of your flocks until they have destroyed you. And they shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls, again, looking to the future of Jerusalem in which you trust, come down throughout all your land and they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given. You see, what is being described here is the future of Israel after they have returned from captivity. Again, they're under the leadership of Ezra and Zerubbabel and Nehemiah. They're those great stories we read in the Old Testament, later in the Old Testament, and really even past the time of Jesus to the year 68 AD. And if you're familiar with history, what happened in 68 AD is the Roman Empire, they set their sights on Jerusalem. And they set their sights on Jerusalem in a way to where they came up against what was a very fortified city, and they laid siege to that city. And they laid siege in such a way, and they were, they were there, and, 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 and as you read through the rest of the chapter, what is described there is what many historians from that time described happened as um, as the Romans came and besieged Jerusalem. And it is quite a brutal time. As you read that, you see, and as you read history, it, it was something that was very dark. And after two years, what eventually happened was the end of that siege and ultimately the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which included the temple that was torn down. And again, Moses, what he did is he looked forward into the future. And there, under the inspiration of the Lord, he prophesied that this was going to happen. And even all the way down to verse 68, where it says, And the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships by the way of which I said to you, you shall never see it again. And there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. And that right there is something that as you read the history of the conquest of Jerusalem by Rome, that as they took prisoners, they didn't have enough room for them in their own you know, area, so they shipped them off to Egypt. And there they were to be sold as slaves. However, many people did not desire them, and so they were truly scattered far away. And again, Moses, he prophesied this. And I point this out again because what is laid out here in the book of Deuteronomy is exact prophecy of what is going to take place in the future of God's people. The people would walk in disobedience. They would walk in idol worship. They would seek after other things other than what God had for them. And as such, the curse and the consequence of that sin, that would overtake them. And again, as believers, pointing out places of prophecy is important. And it's important to see that as we continue to read the Bible, we will see these things come about. But also to the salient point of that is again, the Lord called for his people to realize that as you walk in obedience, there's blessing. As you walk in disobedience, there's consequences, there's issues, there's cursing. And that definitely came to pass in the nation of Israel. And after laying out the blessings of obedience and the cursing of disobedience, we now come to chapters 29 and 30, which now call the people really to the response. And really what is seen through these chapters is the faithfulness of God thus far in the land and all, really from Egypt to where they are currently and what is going to happen and what is needing to happen as they progress. And what we're going to do is read through all of these verses together. We'll make some stops along the way. But to really get this, because as Moses is teaching here, it's meant to be seen as one long-winded talk, one long-winded sermon, if you will, kind of like this one is. And he is showing there what the heart of the Lord is for his people and uh, it's, it's better taken all as one. So if you will, let's pick up in verse 1 of chapter 29 and read through the end of chapter 30, making some comments on the way. Where Moses says, Now these are the words of the covenants which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all of his land, the great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear to this very day. And he says, I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. He says, your clothes have not worn out. 
on you and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came to this place, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, they came out against us to battle, and we conquered them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, to the half-tribe of Manasseh. And so therefore, he says, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. You know, pausing there for a moment, what's happening here? As Moses is, by the inspiration of the Lord, inviting the people into a new covenantal relationship with the Lord. As they're there on the border of Canaan, about to go in to take the land, again, what their fathers had failed to do 40 years prior, he seeks to say, look, you're here, and let's enter into this covenant. Let's walk forward in obedience. And to preface this, to really prime this up, if you will, he shows the faithfulness of God thus far. He says, look, you came out of Egypt. The Lord, he did a great work there. He did that work, and then as you wandered in the wilderness, he continued to be faithful. He said, look at your shoes, look at your clothes, those sandals you have on, look at them, no holes. They they didn't wear out. The Lord, he kept your clothes over 40 years of walking in the desert from falling apart. He's like, you've not been hungry, you've not been thirsty, the Lord has taken care of you. What's more, he says, as enemies came out against you, you conquered them. See, Moses, as he's inviting the people into this covenant relationship, as the Lord is speaking through him, He's seeking to say, look, you're entering into a relationship with a, with a God who is faithful. You're entering into a relationship with a God, a covenant relationship with God who is faithful and who is with you, who's been with you and who will continue to be with you. He's seeking to prime and to build confidence as he's calling them to action. And in verse 10, he says, and all of you stand today before the Lord your God. He says, they're your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones and your wives, also the stranger who's in your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath, which the Lord your God makes with you today, that he may establish you today as a people for himself, that he may be a God to be God to you, just as he spoke, has spoken to you and just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I make this covenant and this oath, not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. For you know that we dwelt in the land of Egypt, that we came through the nations which you passed by, and you saw their abominations and their idols which were among them, wood and stone and silver and gold, so that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations, and that there may be may not be ro- among you a root a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. And so it may not happen that when he hears the words of this curse, that he blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace even though I follow the dictates of my heart as though the drunkard could be included with the sober. The Lord, understand, would not spare him for the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man and every curse that is written in the book that settled on him and the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven and the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel for adversity according to the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of the law so that the coming generation of your children who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a far land would say when they see the plagues of all the land and the sickness which the Lord has laid out, And the whole land is brimstone, salt, burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there. Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adam and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. All nations would say, why has the Lord done so to this land? What does the heat of this great anger mean? And the people would say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods that they did not know and that he had not given to them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against this land to bring on it every curse that is written in the book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. You see, Moses, as he writes here, He tells the people that God revealed to them what he wants them to follow, that they have heard all of his word. They have heard his heart. And he says this, that, hey, as you've heard this, you need to understand that this is for you. And I know you notice there in verses 14 through 19, that as he's speaking there, he draws the attention of the one who would be standing there in the, in the multitude and who would hear these things and seek to say to themselves, yeah, but you know, that, that I'll be okay. You know, I can keep doing what I want to do. I can keep living the way that I want to live and nothing's going to come upon me. However, the Lord, he has something to say about that. As we continue on, you see the Lord would not spare him. His anger of the Lord, his jealousy would burn hot against that man and really against the whole nation. That would be the case. But as they have heard and agreed with him that they needed to now live in light of what God had said. And notice what verse 29 says. 
It says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. You know, Moses is going to say in just a few moments even more clearly what this has to say, but Moses tells the people that, hey, God has revealed to you his heart. That God has revealed to you his word, his will, his desire. There are things that the Lord knows, he says, that are for him to know. He's pointing there to the reality that God's ways are higher, that he holds things. And you know what? Maybe one day we'll know, maybe we won't, because God, he's the Lord. But he says there that, hey, what the Lord has let you know, you know clearly. What the Lord has shown, that is for you to live in light of. And then moving into chapter 30, Moses again acts as a prophet before the people. Read verse one with me, continuing on. He says, now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, that the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart, with all your soul, and the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. And if any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from, a, from there the Lord your God will gather you and from there he will bring you. And the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. And also the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. And the Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand and the fruit of your body and the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of the law. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your hearts, and with all your soul. Again, he acts as a prophet here because what he does is he prophesies not just what could, but would happen in the future of Israel, that as they were taken away because of their disobedience, that as they were away in captivity and exile from the land that God had brought them into, that as they would return to the Lord, he would bring them back. And we see this having taken place again, referencing Ezra and Nehemiah, those great books of the Old Testament, and even the minor prophets that were involved there with those great works. We get to see that. We see God bringing his people back into the land that he had promised them. Again, that came to pass. As they cried out to the God in repentance, he restored them back to the land. But Moses, as he finishes out, he expounds on the clarity and the accessibility of the word of God to the people. And this is really where the rubber meets the road for the people. Pick up me there in verse 11. Because he says, For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us to bring it to us that we may hear and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall know, prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go and possess. I will call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. So therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. You see, Moses again expounds on the, on the clarity and the accessibility of the word of God for his people. It's not shrouded, he seeks to tell them. It's not there in secrecy or far off that they have to go and search it, but it's clearly laid out for them. It's clearly laid out for them to see, to know God has not held back from his people, his word, his heart, his will for them, and as well the consequences of either obedience or disobedience. And Moses shares with them today, he says, I've set before you life and good, death and and evil. And he says to the people, hey, as the Lord has spoken to you, as the Lord wants to lead you, he says, what is before you are these two things. And he says, hey, choose life. 
He says, choose life before the Lord. Choose a life that is lived out for the Lord, before the Lord. Walk in obedience. Because in the obedience, again, there is the blessing that God has for the people. And in disobedience, there is, there is the opposite. There's cursing. And as throughout all of this, and as it is true in our lives, what is now before the people is a choice. What is now before the people is a choice for them to know that, hey, God has given you everything you need. God has given you all the tools, all of his word, all of his direction, all of his heart has been laid out for them. It's clear, it's accessible to them. Now what is needed is for them to choose, again, either life or death, which is presented before both of them. They had to make the choice to live in light of the word and to pattern their lives accordingly or to not. And my friends, the same thing is so true for us. The same thing is so true for our lives. And again, you're here on a Wednesday night, you know this, but it's so good for us to be reminded of tonight that God every single day presents to us a life lived in full for him, life, truly life that is to be lived for him, lived in light of his word, or what is before us is death. What is before us is death. And we have the opportunity every single day because God has created us, not as robots, not as these people just to be moved about. He's created us as people with a free will, And he's given us a choice to choose either him and his word and living in light of that or to choose the opposite. And I can't make, you can't make for me the choice that is before us. We are called each and every day to make the choice that God gives to us. And the Lord shows us clearly within his word and thus by making us really accountable and making us, you know, subject to either consequence of blessing or consequence of, you know, not blessing dealing on which way that we choose. And tonight, in the same way that Moses presented before the people a choice today, the Word of God presents before us a choice. And I ask all of us tonight, what are we choosing? You know, tonight, as you are living your life, thinking over your day, thinking over your week, thinking over this past month, this past year, you know, as we come to the end of a year, uh, I don't know about you, but I begin to start getting very, you know, retrospective about how this year went and looking and saying, God, how did I, how did I live for you? How did I do this past year, Lord? And how, how, how can I live for you in the year to come? Start to think on those things. I don't know if you do or not, but as you do so, it's worth us asking, hey, what am I choosing right now? Am I choosing life and the life-giving life that Jesus offers to me, walking in a relationship with him and obeying his word and walking according to his statutes, his commandments, his plan for my life, knowing that there's blessing? Or am I walking according to my flesh and according to this world and according to what is offered to us? And there's so much that is offered to us in this world. But understand, the Bible is clear that sin, as it's full grown, it brings forth death. Whether it's secret or all out in front, we choose sin, we choose our flesh, we choose death. And death is all we can expect to gain. Death is all we can expect to earn as we know that the wages of sin is death. So tonight, I would ask all of us, the Word of God, I believe, points us to this question, to ask what we are choosing, knowing full well what both bring. What are you choosing tonight? And as you ask that question, if the answer is, man, there's a whole lot of choosing of things that are not of the Lord, understand that tonight, you don't have to stay that way. Understand that tonight, you don't have to leave the same way you came in here. Quite honestly, you don't have to leave worse off than you came here. And I say that because as we come in here, we hear the Word of God we become accountable to what we hear. And so if you come in here with things that are not dealt with, you've chose death and you're continuing to choose death, you know what the word of God says. You leave actually worse than how you came in here. Not the same, you leave worse off. And you don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. We as the church don't have to live in that way because what is provided to us is a life of forgiveness, a life lived under the grace of Jesus Christ extended to us and a life that is full as we are filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the word of God into a life that is amazing, a life that is blessed, a life that's not always easy, but a life that is blessed. So tonight, what are you choosing? And if you're choosing something that is against the Lord, I ask tonight if you will choose to deal with that, knowing that the Lord is here tonight with us to deal with that, and he's here to help us with that, and we need his help. We absolutely do. We need his help in every single thing. To keep living the life of obedience that we're called to, we need his help to deal with disobedience in our life and to walk forward no longer in that. We need his help. And tonight, be, under, be, be fully confident that the Lord is here to help us. He's here to deal with things if we're willing to let him deal with them. And so tonight, ask the question to yourself. What's more, ask the Lord to search your heart 
and speak to you as well. And as he reveals, man, deal with those things. Deal with them that we as the church would choose life and would walk forward with him into the abundant life, the blessed life that he has for us. Would you pray with me?